Section four of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book one, chapter six. A little dinner, not more than the muses, with all the guests clever and some pretty, offers human life and human nature under very favourable circumstances. In the present instance, too, every one was anxious to please, for the host was entirely well-bred, never selfish in little things, and always contributed his quota to the general fund of polished sociability. Although there was really only one thought in every male mind present, still regard for the ladies, and some little apprehension of the servants, banished politics from discourse during the greater part of the dinner, with the occasional exception of some rapid and flying allusion which the initiated understood, but which remained a mystery to the rest. Nevertheless, an old story now and then well told by Mr. Ormsby, a new joke now and then well introduced by Mr. Gay, some dashing assertion by Mr. Rigby, which, though wrong, was startling. This agreeable blending of anecdote, jest, and paradox kept everything fluent and produced that degree of mild excitation which is desirable. Lord Monmouth sometimes summed up with an epigrammatic sentence and turned the conversation by a question in case it dwelt too much on the same topic. Lord Eskdale addressed himself principally to the ladies, inquired after their morning drive and doings, spoke of new fashions, and quoted a letter from Paris. Madame Colonna was not witty, but she had that sweet Roman frankness which is so charming. The presence of a beautiful woman, natural and good-tempered, even if she be not a Lespinasse or a de Stal, is animating. Nevertheless, owing probably to the absorbing powers of the forbidden subject, there were moments when it seemed that a pause was impending, and Mr. Ormsby, an old hand, seized one of these critical instants to address a good-natured question to Coningsby, whose acquaintance he had already cultivated by taking wine with him. "'And how do you like Eton?' asked Mr. Ormsby. It was the identical question which had been presented to Coningsby in the memorable interview of the morning, and which had received no reply or rather had produced on his part a sentimental ebullition that had absolutely destined or doomed him to the church. "'I should like to see the fellow who didn't like Eton,' said Coningsby, briskly determined this time to be very brave. "'Gad, I must go down and see the old place,' said Mr. Ormsby, touched by a pensive reminiscence. "'One can get a good bed and a bottle of port at the Christopher still?' "'You had better come and try, sir,' said Coningsby. "'If you will come some day and dine with me at the Christopher, "'I will give you such a bottle of champagne as you never tasted yet.' The Marquis looked at him, but said nothing. "'Ah, I like the dinner at the Christopher,' said Mr. Ormsby. "'After mutton, mutton, mutton every day, it was not a bad thing.' "'We had venison for dinner every week last season,' said Coningsby. "'Buckhurst had it sent up from his park.' but I don't care for dinner. Breakfast is my lounge. Ah, those little rolls and pats of butter, said Mr. Ormsby. Short commons, though. What do you think we did in my time? We used to send over the way to get a mutton chop. I wish you could see Buckhurst and me at breakfast, said Coningsby, with a pound of castle sausages. What Buckhurst is that, Harry? inquired Lord Monmouth, in a tone of some interest, and for the first time calling him by his Christian name. Sir Charles Buckhurst, sir, a Berkshire man. Shirley Park is his place. Why, that must be Charlie's son, Eskdale, said Lord Monmouth. I had no idea he could be so young. He married late, you know, and had nothing but daughters for a long time. "'Well, I hope there will be no reform bill for Eton,' said Lord Monmouth musingly. The servants had now retired. "'I think, Lord Monmouth,' said Mr. Rigby, "'we must ask permission to drink one toast to-day.' "'Nay, I will myself give it,' he replied. "'Madame Colonna, you will, I am sure, join us when we drink the Duke.' "'Ah, what a man!' exclaimed the Princess. "'What a pity it is you have a house of commons here. "'England would be the greatest country in the world "'if it were not for that house of commons. "'It makes so much confusion.' 
"'Don't abuse our property,' said Lord Eskdale. "'Lord Monmouth and I have still twenty votes of that same body between us.' "'And there is a combination,' said Rigby, "'by which you may still keep them.' "'Ah, now for Rigby's combination,' said Lord Eskdale. "'The only thing that can save this country,' said Rigby, "'is a coalition on a sliding scale.' "'You had better buy up the Birmingham Union and the other bodies,' said Lord Monmouth. "'I believe it might all be done for two or three hundred thousand pounds, "'and the newspapers, too. "'Pitt would have settled this business long ago.' "'Well, at any rate we are in,' said Rigby, "'and we must do something.' "'I should like to see Gray's list of new peers,' said Lord Eskdale. "'They say there are several members of our club in it.' "'And the claims to the honour are so opposite,' said Lucian Gay, "'one on account of his large estate, another because he has none, "'one because he has a well-grown family to perpetuate the title, "'another because he has no heir and no power of ever obtaining one.' "'I wonder how he will form his cabinet,' said Lord Monmouth. "'The old story won't do.' "'I hear that Baring is to be one of the new cards. "'They say it will please the city,' said Lord Eskdale. I suppose they will pick out of the hedge and ditch everything that has ever had the semblance of liberalism. Affairs in my time were never so complicated, said Mr. Ormsby. Nay, it appears to me to lie in a nutshell, said Lucian Gay. One party wishes to keep their old boroughs, and the other to get their new peers. End of Book One, Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven the future historian of the country will be perplexed to ascertain what was the distant object which the Duke of Wellington proposed to himself in the political manoeuvres of May 1832. It was known that the passing of the Reform Bill was a condition absolute with the King. It was unquestionable that the first general election under the new law must ignominiously expel the anti-reform ministry from power, who would then resume their seats on the opposition benches in both houses, with the loss not only of their boroughs, but of that reputation for political consistency, which might have been some compensation for the parliamentary influence of which they had been deprived. It is difficult to recognise in this premature effort of the anti-reform leader to thrust himself again into the conduct of public affairs, any indications of the prescient judgment which might have been expected from such a quarter. It savoured rather of restlessness than of energy, and, while it proved in its progress not only an ignorance on his part of the public mind, but of the feelings of his own party, it terminated under circumstances which were humiliating to the Crown, and painfully significant of the future position of the House of Lords in the new constitutional scheme. The Duke of Wellington has ever been the votary of circumstances. He cares little for causes. He watches events rather than seeks to produce them. It is a characteristic of the military mind. Rapid combinations, the result of quick, vigilant, and comprehensive glance, are generally triumphant in the field. But in civil affairs, where results are not immediate, in diplomacy and in the management of deliberative assemblies, where there is much intervening time and many counteracting causes, this velocity of decision, this fitful and precipitate action, are often productive of considerable embarrassment and sometimes of terrible discomfiture. It is remarkable that men celebrated for military prudence are often found to be headstrong statesmen. In civil life, a great general is frequently and strangely the creature of impulse, influenced in his political movements by the last snatch of information, and often the creature of the last aide-de-camp who has his ear. We shall endeavour to trace in another chapter the reasons which on this, as on previous and subsequent occasions, induced Sir Robert Peel to stand aloof, if possible, from official life, and made him reluctant to re-enter the service of his sovereign. In the present instance, even temporary success could only have been secured by the utmost decision, promptness, and energy. These were all wanting, some were afraid to follow the bold example of their leader, many were disinclined. In eight-and-forty hours it was known there was a hitch. 
The Reform Party, who had been rather stupefied than appalled by the accepted mission of the Duke of Wellington, collected their scattered senses and rallied their forces. The agitators harangued, the mobs hooted, the City of London, as if the King had again tried to seize the five members, appointed a permanent committee of the Common Council to watch the fortunes of the great national measure, and to report daily. Brooks, which was the only place that at first was really frightened and talked of compromise, grew valiant again, while young Whig heroes jumped upon club-room tables and delivered fiery invectives. Emboldened by these demonstrations, the House of Commons met in great force, and passed a vote which struck without disguise at all rival powers in the state, virtually announced its supremacy, revealed the forlorn position of the House of Lords under the new arrangement, and seemed to lay for ever the fluttering phantom of regal prerogative. It was on the ninth of May that Lord Lyndhurst was with the King, and on the fifteenth all was over. Nothing in parliamentary history so humiliating as the funeral oration delivered that day by the Duke of Wellington over the old constitution, that model on the Venetian, had governed England since the accession of the House of Hanover. He described his sovereign, when his grace first repaired to his majesty, as in a state of the greatest difficulty and distress, appealing to his never-failing loyalty to extricate him from his trouble and vexation. The Duke of Wellington, representing the House of Lords, sympathizes with the King, and pledges his utmost efforts for His Majesty's relief. But after five days' exertion, this man of indomitable will and invincible fortunes resigns the task in discomfiture and despair, and alleges as the only and sufficient reason for his utter and hopeless defeat that the House of Commons had come to a vote which ran counter to the contemplated exercise of the prerogative. From that moment power passed from the House of Lords to another assembly. But if the peers have ceased to be magnificos, may it not also happen that the sovereign may cease to be a doge? It is not impossible that the political movements of our time, which seem on the surface to have a tendency to democracy, may have, in reality, a monarchical bias. In less than a fortnight's time, the House of Lords, like James the Second, having abdicated their functions by absence, the Reform Bill passed, the ardent monarch, who a few months before had expressed his readiness to go down to Parliament in a hackney coach, if necessary, to assist its progress, now declining personally to give his assent to its provisions. In the protracted discussions to which this celebrated measure gave rise, nothing is more remarkable than the perplexities into which the speakers of both sides are thrown when they touch upon the nature of the representative principle. On one hand, it was maintained that under the old system the people were virtually represented, while on the other it was triumphantly urged that if the principle be conceded, the people should not be virtually but actually represented. But who are the people, and where do you draw a line, and why should there be any? It was urged that the contribution to the taxes was the constitutional qualification for the suffrage but we have established a system of taxation in this country of so remarkable a nature that the beggar who chooses quid as he sweeps a crossing is contributing to the imposts. Is he to have a vote? He is one of the people, and he yields his quota to the public burdens. Amid these conflicting statements and these confounding conclusions, it is singular that no member of either House should have recurred to the original character of these popular assemblies which have always prevailed among the northern nations. We still retain in the antique phraseology of our statutes the term which might have beneficially guided a modern reformer in his reconstructive labours. When the crowned Northman consulted on the welfare of his kingdom, he assembled the estates of his realm. Now, an estate is a class of the nation invested with political rights. There appeared the estate of the clergy, of the barons, of other classes. In the Scandinavian kingdoms to this day, the estate of the peasants sends its representatives to the Diet. In England, under the Normans, the church and the baronage were convoked, 
together with the estate of the community, a term which then probably described the inferior holders of land, whose tenure was not immediate of the crown. This third estate was so numerous that convenience suggested its appearance by representation, while the others, more limited, appeared, and still appear, personally. The third estate was reconstructed as circumstances developed themselves. It was a reform of Parliament when the towns were summoned. In treating the house of the third estate as the house of the people, and not as the house of a privileged class, the Ministry and Parliament of 1831 virtually conceded the principle of universal suffrage. In this point of view, the ten-pound franchise was an arbitrary, irrational, and impolitic qualification. It had, indeed, the merit of simplicity, and so had the constitutions of Abbessier, but its immediate and inevitable result was Chartism. But if the Ministry and Parliament of 1831 had announced that the time had arrived when the Third Estate should be enlarged and reconstructed, they would have occupied an intelligible position. And if, instead of simplicity of elements in its reconstruction, they had sought, on the contrary, various and varying materials which would have neutralized the painful predominance of any particular interest in the new scheme, and prevented those banded jealousies which have been its consequences, the nation would have found itself in a secure condition. Another class, not less numerous than the existing one, and invested with privileges not less important, would have been added to the public estates of the realm, and the bewildering phrase, the people, would have remained, what it really is, a term of natural philosophy and not of political science. During this eventful week of May 1832, when an important revolution was effected in the most considerable of modern kingdoms, in a manner so tranquil that the victims themselves were scarcely conscious at the time of the catastrophe, Coningsby passed his hours in unaccustomed pleasures and in novel excitement. Although he heard daily from the lips of Mr. Rigby and his friends that England was forever lost, the assembled guests still contrived to do justice to his grandfather's excellent dinners. Nor did the impending ruin that awaited them prevent the Princess Colonna from going to the opera, whither she very good-naturedly took Coningsby. Madame Colonna, indeed, gave such gratifying accounts of her dear young friend that Coningsby became daily a greater favourite with Lord Monmouth, who cherished the idea that his grandson had inherited not merely the colour of his eyes, but something of his shrewd and fearless spirit. With Lucretia, Coningsby did not much advance. She remained silent and sullen. She was not beautiful, pallid, with a lowering brow, and an eye that avoided meeting another's. Madame Colonna, though good-natured, felt for her something of the affection for which stepmothers are celebrated. Lucretia, indeed, did not encourage her kindness, which irritated her stepmother, who seemed seldom to address her, but to rate and chide. Lucretia never replied, but looked dogged. Her father, the prince, did not compensate for this treatment. The memory of her mother, whom he had greatly disliked, did not soften his heart. He was a man still young, slender, not tall, very handsome, but worn, a haggard Antinous, his beautiful hair daily thinning, his dress rich and effeminate, many jewels, much lace. He seldom spoke, but was polished, though moody. At the end of the week Coningsby returned to Eton. On the eve of his departure, Lord Monmouth desired his grandson to meet him in his apartments on the morrow, before quitting his roof. This farewell visit was as kind and gracious as the first one had been repulsive. Lord Monmouth gave Coningsby his blessing and ten pounds, desired that he would order a dress, anything he liked, for the approaching Montem, which Lord Monmouth meant to attend, and informed his grandson that he should order that in future a proper supply of game and venison should be forwarded to Eton for the use of himself and his friends. End of chapter 7 Book 1, Chapter 8 After eight o'clock school, the day following the return of Coningsby, 
According to custom, he repaired to Buckhurst's room, where Henry Sidney, Lord Vere, and our hero held with him their breakfast mess. They were all in the fifth form and habitual companions, on the river or on the fives wall, at cricket or at football. The return of Coningsby, their leader alike in sport and study, inspired them to-day with unusual spirits, which, to say the truth, were never particularly depressed. Where he had been, what he had seen, what he had done, what sort of fellow his grandfather was, whether the visit had been a success, here were materials for almost endless inquiry. And indeed, to do them justice, the last question was not the least exciting to them, for the deep and cordial interest which all felt in Coningsby's welfare far outweighed the curiosity which under ordinary circumstances they would have experienced on the return of one of their companions from an unusual visit to London. The report of their friend imparted to them unbounded satisfaction when they learned that his relative was a splendid fellow, that he had been loaded with kindness and favours, that Monmouth House, the wonders of which he rapidly sketched, was hereafter to be his home, that Lord Monmouth was coming down to Montem, that Coningsby was to order any dress he liked, to build a new boat if he chose, and finally had been pouched in a manner worthy of a marquis and a grandfather. "'By the by,' said Buckhurst, when the hubbub had a little subsided, "'I am afraid you will not half like it, Coningsby. But, old fellow, I had no idea you would be back this morning. I have asked Millbank to breakfast here.' A cloud stole over the clear brow of Coningsby. "'It was my fault,' said the amiable Henry Sidney, "'but I really wanted to be civil to Millbank, "'and as you were not here, I put Buckhurst up to ask him.' "'Well,' said Coningsby, as if sullenly resigned, "'never mind, but why should you ask an infernal manufacturer?' "'Why, the Duke always wished me to pay him some attention,' "'said Lord Henry mildly, his family were so civil to us when we were at Manchester. Manchester, indeed, said Coningsby. If you knew what I do about Manchester, a pretty state we have been in in London this week past with your Manchesters and Birminghams. Come, come, Coningsby, said Lord Vere, the son of a Whig minister. I am all for Manchester and Birmingham. It's all up with the country, I can tell you, said Coningsby, with the air of one who was in the secret. "'My father says it will go all right now,' rejoined Lord Vere. "'I had a letter from my sister yesterday.' "'They say we shall all lose our estates, though,' said Buckhurst. "'I know I shall not give up mine without a fight. "'Shirley was besieged, you know, in the civil wars, "'and the rebels got infernally licked. "'I think that all the people about Beaumanoir would stand with the Duke,' said Lord Henry, pensively. "'Well, you may depend upon it. You will have it very soon,' said Coningsby. "'I know it from the best authority.' "'It depends on whether my father remains in,' said Lord Vere. "'He is the only man who can govern the country now. All say that.' At this moment Millbank appeared. He was a good-looking boy, somewhat shy, and yet with a sincere expression in his countenance. He was evidently not extremely intimate with those who were now his companions.' Buckhurst and Henry Sidney and Vere welcomed him cordially. He looked at Coningsby with some constraint, and then said, "'You have been in London, Coningsby?' "'Yes, I have been there during all the row.' "'You must have had a rare lark.' "'Yes, if having your windows broken by a mob be a rare lark. They could not break my grandfather's, though. Monmouth House is in a courtyard. All noblemen's houses should be in courtyards.' "'I was glad to see it all ended very well,' said Millbank. "'It has not begun yet,' said Coningsby. "'What?' said Millbank. "'Why, the revolution.' "'The reform bill will prevent a revolution,' my father said,' said Millbank. "'By Jove, here's the goose,' said Buckhurst. At this moment there entered the room a little boy, the scion of a noble house, bearing a roasted goose, which he had carried from the kitchen of the opposite inn, the Christopher.' The lower boy, or fag, depositing his burthen, asked his master whether he had further need of him, and Buckhurst, after looking round the table and ascertaining that he had not, gave him permission to retire. But he had scarcely disappeared 
when his master singing out, Lower boy St. John, he immediately re-entered and demanded his master's pleasure, which was that he should pour some water in the teapot. This being accomplished, St. John really made his escape, and retired to a pupil room where the bullying of a tutor, because he had no derivations, exceeded in all probability the bullying of his master, had he contrived in his passage from the Christopher to have upset the goose or dropped the sausages. In their merry meal, the reform bill was forgotten. Their thoughts were soon concentrated in their little world, though it must be owned that visions of palaces and beautiful ladies did occasionally flit over the brain of one of the company. But for him especially there was much of interest and novelty. So much had happened in his absence. There was a week's arrears for him of Eton annals. They were recounted in so fresh a spirit and in such vivid colours that Coningsby lost nothing by his London visit. All the bold feats that had been done, and all the bright things that had been said, all the triumphs and all the failures and all the scrapes, how popular one master had made himself, and how ridiculous another, all was detailed with a liveliness, a candour, and a picturesque ingenuousness which would have made the fortune of a Herodotus or a Froissart. "'I'll tell you what,' said Buckhurst, I move that after twelve we five go up to Maidenhead. Agreed, agreed. End of chapter 8